Okay, so um, I think I'm going to get started. So, hello everyone. Um, my name is Bernard Lee. I'm one of the project administrators of the Ganglio project. So today I'm going to talk to you about Ganglio, which is a monitoring um, software. And the project has been around, you know, for, for 10 years. So we're going to tell you about what, you know, what the software does and how, why you would want to use it to monitor your computers, specifically, you know, clusters, grids, or just web farms. So actually, before we begin, I just wanted to have a quick poll. So who has heard of Ganglia? Okay. So who has actually used it? Okay, so it seems like a fair amount. So um, maybe you guys know, you know, uh, quite a bit about it already, so. Okay, so. Um, well, actually, let me just briefly introduce myself. So, I mean, I'm Bernard, so I've been working on uh, high-performance computing uh, related open source software. So, I've worked on provisioning tools like System Imager, Oscar, and monitoring side, you know, um, working on Ganglia. So, that's, uh, for the past few years, that's what I've been working, you know, just getting involved with a lot of the open source um, software. So Ganglia, so what is Ganglia? So the goal is basically um, the software is to gather um, system resource metrics in real time and so that you can like figure out what your, your, your host is you know, doing. So you know you have a, um, you know, even like one host to hundreds to thousands of computers, you know, you, ha you set it up and they're running, but you want to find out like what, you know, what a system resource is like and what it's doing. So when you have such a system, you know, you want to have a software that gives you a centralized view of what's going on. So that's what um, Ganglia's goal is. So the project started around 1999 by Matt Massey. Um, so it started at uh, University of California at Berkeley. So it's part of the Millennium Project. So it's a um, project, you know, that was involved with building clusters and they want to find out what's, you know, what the, the clusters, you know, doing, like, you know, how, how his system load is and things like that. So Matt wrote this software and, you know, for the past 10 years, basically you think of monitoring for cluster, you know, you think of Ganglia, it's somewhat become the de facto standard for, for monitoring um, system resources. So it's a very lightweight process. So when you monitor, like, you know, these systems, you don't want your monitoring daemon to actually take up a lot of resources because that, you know, that would be very wasteful. You actually want to do real work on, on your computers. So, I mean, if you're, if you're monitoring software is in the way of that, that sort of defeats the purpose. So it's very lightweight in terms of, like, CPU and memory usage is, doesn't, doesn't use that much resources. And basically, you have a monitoring daemon called gmond, and you run it on every node. And there's a, basically all the metrics that's collected on each host is aggregated on a separate server, which runs the gmetad daemon. And you know, these metrics are aggregated into round-robin database files. So ROD files are basically time-slice um, data. So it's, it's good for like storing these metric data so that you can go back in time and look at you know, what, what's, um, what your system has been doing in, in the past. Again, you know, it's a very lightweight agent. It supports um, most you know, Unix, Linux systems and even Windows uh, via SigWind. So basically the code, uh, um, you know, it, you can run it on anything. And, and it doesn't matter whether you're running the um, ganglia on like these different OSs, they will all work with each other. So you can have a, a mix um, sort of hybrid system as in many large corporations, you would run different OSs and then you can use one tool to basically monitor everything. Keep pressing the wrong button. Okay, so it's BSD license, uh, open source license. So, um, so what I'm going to talk about. Um, so basically, what you can do with this software. Um, you know, what does it look like when you actually use it as a user, and a bit about the architecture, and some you know advanced topics like. So by default, Ganglia would uh, collect 
uh, 30 or so metrics about your host, like you know CPU load, memory, um, network, and all that stuff. So that's the default one that's you know collected by default. But if you want to collect your own metrics, like how your Apache server is doing, you know your memcached or like just basically anything you can. Um, somehow collect from your operating system. You can plug these information into into Gangla. So I'll go into it a little bit in detail. Um, how what you know it, Gangla is very scalable, but so we're going to talk about some 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 issues when you when you run into like you know thousands of hoes and or tens of thousands of hoes. And you know cloud computing is quite a hot topic nowadays. So just just to give you some brief um, notes about what you know the environment is like if you want to use um, Gangla to monitor it, and then we'll have uh, Daniel Pocock just come up and give some user testimonial, and then you know basically I'll end with you know how you can get started and get involved with the project. So typical users. Um, you know, the project came about with from high performance computing. So these are clusters of computers basically have one goal and it's just to crunch a lot of numbers, you know, run a lot of parallel code. And and Ganglio came about and it, it makes it very easy to like figure out like what your cluster is doing. So, you know, it has this hierarchy of like a grid and a cluster so that you can find out um, like you know, your if your cluster's doing how your cluster's doing on one end and then on the other clusters, like you can sort of aggregate all the different data. And um, you know, launch enterprises, you know, you have you know different servers like web servers, database servers, you know, you have a large corporation that you have many computers that do different things. So you can use Gangla to, you know, check what how these um, servers are performing and then um, you can, you know, go back in time, look at the history, and you know, figure out, you know, what's what's going on. So it's pretty pretty similar um, um, uses. And um, like, you know, in your IT environment, you know, you have support issues, and like, why is your system not performing as you think it should? So you can look at, you can also use it to look at um, like memory utilization and. And you know when when your servers reach a certain load, and you maybe it's time to buy like new computers or actually upgrade your memory, or whatever. So you can use Gangler to look at all these um, you know pretty graphs and give you an idea of how your your systems are performing. And then you know you can see okay if a whole bunch of like servers are have really high load, maybe you can like shift the load around and maybe like even virtualize it. So. And you can use it to troubleshoot applications. So, like, you have different users running, you know, different code on your computer, and maybe you're trying to figure out like why is causing. This. Like, first of all, you need to know that um, your your system's having high I/O load. But how how would you tell? Like, if you have a thousands computer, you're not going to log into each one to do a top and like figure it out. So, with something like Gangla, it's like has these graphs with aggregated like information. So you know, basically, you can see very quickly that you know what your systems are doing, and with that information, it helps you troubleshoot you know application problems and things like that. And um, you know, when you're writing new software, sometimes you don't know like you know how how it performs, and you know you use it like you don't know how much resources it uses. So again, you know, Gangly is, is useful for these kind of um, workload. So just give you an example of like some people who use this Ganglia. So these are just like names you can find out from my website. You know, there's a, like a little bar on the side that tells you like who uses Ganglia. So um, I like to point out especially about Flickr. So I know um, the previous operations manager who was always say like you know use Ganglia. What does he use it for? It's for capacity planning. It's like you have these graphs that tells you, okay, well, we hit sort of hit the resource wall. It's maybe it's time to to buy like new computers. So, so you would go up, go to your your supervisor, your manager, and say, okay, well, I mean, this is the real load, and you know, we need more computers to handle these loads. So it's 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 good for that. So 
So let me give you a um, quick demo of what Gangler looks like. So this is, you know, the Berkeley grid. Um, so it's divided into different, um, so you see here you have um, a main grid. So this is sort of like the top level. Um, it aggregates all the, um, all the metrics you see at the bottom here. So this is, this is one cluster which you can click into. So this red line just tells you, okay, this is the max, the number of CPUs in this cluster. And um, so, you know, is the number of running processes here, this is the gray stuff is like the load. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different um, type of charts that you can see. So it's like memory, network, so down here, these are individual hosts. Um, so red here means it's sort of a high load, and green means it's not that busy. So again, you can click into it here and see what each individual host is doing. So this is um, one host. It says you know it's been up since this time, and you know it gives you a whole a lot of information. But so basically, all these metrics is collected on the host level and aggregated up to the top. So so a collection of hosts is a cluster, and a collection of um, clusters is a grid. So you can actually even have like a grid of grids, so that you know you can sort of aggregate it, you know, all the way up. So these are stats of individual hosts. So it's pretty self-explanatory. Okay. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the uh, architecture. Oops. So, so every node runs the gmond agent, so that's like what you run on individual hosts. And so it doesn't keep any like historic data locally, so it's just, you know, um, just the data just sent, sent around. So if the data is transmitted, so the metric data is transmitted um, by default, it uses multicast. Um, so in environments where like multicast could be considered like chatty, like you don't want to send too many packets, what you could do is um, you can use, oops. So you can use um, unicast UDP packets, so that you know, you know, reduces the, the amount of like network traffic. And then basically you have this gmetad server that aggregates all the data and stores it in our default. So I think I mentioned that uh, previously already. And then all this information is that presented on the web server, which basically you know the uh, serves the web page you saw, and you know you install that web server like Apache or like Lightning or whatever, and and you basically it runs on the same server as your gmetad um, process. And it's used to like create the graphs and the and the and the charts that you see. So let's just run through um, what it looks like. So by default, it uses multicast because it's very easy to set up. It's basically setting up is just you know just start the daemon. The configuration by default would use multicast. Um, so every node would transmit its own metrics to the multicast group. So you don't need to do anything special. And every node would receive metric from each other. So essentially, you talk to one node, it would know the metrics information of the entire everything, um, every node from that from that multicast group. And you know, it has yeah. Again, it, it just every node would already know like what the the metric information of the other guys. And the node can actually be pulled um, by a specific port, and then it will give you like an XML um, sort of output of what like the metric looks like, and that's what we use um, sort of to send the information around. So then we have the gmetad server and the web server that aggregates all the data. So the gmetad server pulls in the multicast environment, it pulls any one of them. So if, for those of you who have used it, in the example, it sort of um, alludes to that you have to add each host 
Um, like, so there's a data source that points to like a particular G1D host. So the configuration, so it leads that you have to put every host in the multicast group, but it's not necessary because actually it's mainly for redundancy. So in case like um, if your multicast group, one host goes down, you can go to the, the other guys. But basically you just pull one host in the group and then you get, you know, you'll get all the information of all the hosts. And um, so RD files are created and, you know, to, to store the metrics. And then um, from the web browser, you can see um, the graphs and the charts and to see what, what your um, installation is doing. So I'm just going to talk about some advanced topics. Um, so I mentioned previously there by default, it um, Ganglet collects all these standard metrics, but what if you have your own like metric that you want to collect that's not part of the standard metric? So we have this um, command line tool called gmetric that, that you can basically feed it metrics. And typically you run it, um, you either write a script that you know, gets all this data, like um, you write a program to get like the temperature reading of your host, like usually there's some command that you can run. And you would feed it to Gmetric, and then your cron job would run it like every couple minutes just to feed it the uh, information. So in uh, newer versions of Ganglia, the, there's a um, we wrote a module interface to Gmon D, so you don't need to use Gmetric anymore. So basically, you could write C or Python code that, um, and then the modules has callback and Basically, you set a value for like how often you know GMD would get the metric, and this is just snippets of code that that um, you write to basically collect the, the data. So I'll, I'll show. I think the next slide shows you how it works. So in this case, you don't need to worry about like having a cron job. So we, so the GMD process would you know be in charge of like periodically getting all this information. So this is just a pretty stripped down example of um, what this module interface looks like. So the first definition is basically, well, this, basically what this does is, you know, it generates a random number and it feeds it into GMondi. So the first one basically does all your, your work. So back to the temperature example, you would write um, some code to get the temperature reading. And then you, you would have a you would init your metric and just feed it in. So um, the the team the time max here is just like how long it takes um, before you would um, feed it the, the data. And the unit here is like you know it's just an integer. And it's actually pretty straightforward. So there's in the wiki page we have some document on how to to write these uh, these modules. So. Like, um, so Ganglia is designed to, to monitor a lot of computers. So we notice that, you know, when, it, um, when you have a thousand computers, you, we start to have this scalability issue. Um, so what the problem is, is that by default, you have like 30 metrics. And, and if you have a thousand computers, that's like 30,000 metrics. So all these, each metrics, when it's collected, you have to write it out to ROD files. So that means there's a lot of like I/O happening. So previously, what we did was um, to put the RD files on tempfs. So it's basically just just uh, RAM. So it's really speedy. So that sort of al alleviate the problem. So you know it could still continue functioning. But the problem is if you put your RD files in tempfs, then you know once the GMDD server reboots and it's all gone. So you basically you need to sync it to um, this so that you keep this um, historic data. So in the new version of RD2, there's a, a new daemon called RD cache D. So basically what it does is um, it, it hangs on to, so on, it hangs on to write processes of these RD files so that it will like, it will hang on to a couple updates until it's a specific time has passed or that you know there's enough like updates and they write it out at once. So in that case it sort of buffers the 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 write so it reduces the IO levels by quite a bit. So so if you have like you know a, if your if your G 
is monitoring like over you know a thousand hosts, then then this is something that you can consider. So it's better than the tempfs approach because you don't need to you know sort of sync the the files and and um, it's just a better well-rounded uh, solution. Okay, so I'm not gonna try to like give my own definition of cloud computing because there's already like so many, but um, I guess I'll just talk briefly about like how we as you know, the Ganglia project want to address this. So basically for us like Ganglia, um, the cloud environments are dynamic. So Ganger was designed to monitor um, clusters and grids, which are pretty static. So you provision at once, basically you don't, you know, you don't think of like, you know, it going away. It's just you just keep adding more hosts. Um, so, so yeah. So basically, we need to figure out how to handle this dynamic nature. So in terms of like uh, networking, there's no multicast support. So by default, Ganger uses multicast. Obviously, you can use unicast, which I mentioned, but you know, if you can't use multicast, it, it changes like how you you set it up. And all these guys basically have like all these uh, cloud computers. Basically, they have WAN IP addresses. So when you configure it, um, you need to like for load balancing purposes, you need to have some way of bootstrapping the configuration. So you would maybe when you you're your um, cloud host boots up. Maybe it will talk to a centralized server to figure out, okay, well, which um, which host I should like send my metric data to. So there, these are some things that, that we need to think about. And in going back to the dynamic nature, um, so you have this host Dmax, which basically tells Ganglia how long to hang on to a to a host. So um, in typical cluster environment, you actually do want to know when the host goes down, but then like, because you know, in cloud environments, you ramp up and round down like pretty, pretty quickly. So do you, do you really want to like, you know, keep track of it that way? So basically if the host DMAX, you adjust it and you know, it just sort of um, ex ignores that the host is gone. So, okay, so I'm gonna now, um, Hand off over to Daniel, who's gonna, you know, give some user testimonial. Okay, um, my name's Daniel Pocock. Um, I'm working at a large bank in London. Um, I've been deploying Ganglia. Um, I've also been involved with the Ganglia open source project for virtually the whole time I've been working on this project for my employer. Um, so I'm currently working as the release manager in the project as well. Um, I've been doing that for about 18 months. Um, Using open source uh, methods is a key part of the job. Um, it's something that was discussed right at the beginning at the, um, at the interview stage, and I indicated that this is a way that I, that I work, um, and they were quite keen to pursue that with me. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about um, both what we've done with Ganglia, the challenges we've faced, and also um, you know, the um, aspects of working on an open source project in a corporate environment. Uh, so every, every big company has a different attitude to open source software. Um, and you've probably seen this, that some companies um, you know, talk openly about their involvement with, with open source and with Linux. And other companies are very um, sort of wedded to Microsoft in, in a big way. Um, So there's obviously distinctions between the meaning of free software and open source software. Um, in a business, and particularly in a bank, um, yeah, financial concerns are important. Um, so we'll just talk about free as in no price tag. Um, so in the good old days, you know, people didn't have to um, worry too much about the cost of software. 
and they'd often buy things based on the support contracts, um, the size of the vendor, and various other factors. Um, these days, people are looking at a wider range of options. Um, I don't think I need to, to go into the reasons behind that. Um, but open source software is being looked at a lot more seriously. Um, and where open source software provides like a credible alternative, um, people have to look at it. Um, on the other hand, um, using public email lists, um, IRC chat, um, sharing code on the public internet, these create issues for, for many organisations. They create issues of, of um, how the company has been um, portrayed like on the internet, um, you know, the sharing of intellectual property. Um, these are all challenges for different people in the company, some of them who are not you know, from a software development background, to put it mildly. Um, Ganglia has had a, um, it's provided a compelling reason to have those debates um, in the organisation where I'm working, um, and it has a relatively unique status. Um, and we'll look at some of the reasons for that. Um, it's not highly controversial um, because it's a monitoring tool. So it's not the core business of the, of the company. Um, the core business is, is banking and not um, system monitoring. So it's not a big loss if, um, you know, if we're collaborating on a, on a system monitoring tool. Um, so we can do that um, with the Ganglia project quite effectively because of the modular nature of the project. Um, as Bernard mentioned before, with uh, version 3.1 of Ganglia, you can develop your own metrics um, as modules um, in C or Python, um, and you can feed metrics in with Gmetric. Um, so if we have a need to develop a, um, a metric um, that uses proprietary code, um, we can do that, and that code can be separated using the module interface. Um, so if we want to share parts of the, of the common agent code, as long as that module interface is stable, um, then we can, we can separate those things very easily. Um, just looking at the large enterprise environment, uh, you've got a mix of different platforms. You've got platforms from different generations. So you have some machines running recent versions of Red Hat. You'll have other machines running, say, Windows NT4, for example, which is quite an old system. So if you, if you look around in an organisation that's large enough, you, you will find a little bit of everything. I mean, you, you'll find mainframes if you, if you look around. Um, the users um, you know, have a whole range of different concerns. Um, they, they're particularly concerned about something that might make their system less stable, that might steal resources from their application, um, or that might um, you know, add complexity to uh, managing their hosts. Fortunately, the, um, the Ganglia agent is lightweight. It runs on many of the platforms um, in a big environment. Um, the source code can be tweaked if necessary because it's open source. Um, so if we have a particular need, we can recompile it for a particular platform. If we don't want to use a particular library, or something, some of the libraries can be um, can be taken. Some of the libraries can be um, disabled. So the PCRE support, um, which has been added recently, is is a purely optional feature. Um, so we can disable that. Um, some of the challenges that we face using the, the Ganglia product in particular, um, it's heavily reliant on DNS. Um, once again, you know, big organisations have a range of DNS problems. They're not you know, connected directly to public internet DNS servers. Um, if you've had a lot of mergers and other corporate activity, then you may have several different DNS zones within the organisation, and they might be separated over different firewalls. There may be um, you know, overlapping IP space and a whole range of things. Now, Ganglia relies on reverse DNS lookups, um, and it relies on, um, on the host names to generate file names for the graphs. 
and to generate the URLs for looking at those graphs. Um, so when, when you have a, a lot of DNS-related issues in your network, um, then those will be reflected in how you manage ganglia. Um, it's not clear how ganglia is intended to perform with short polling intervals. Um, while looking through the GMeta D code recently, I found some cases where um, poll intervals have been randomised by five seconds either way. Um, but if your polling interval is, say, five seconds and you randomise by five seconds, then you could reduce the interval to zero or you could increase it to ten. Um, so I found that wasn't um, very effective. So we decided to, to tweak some parts of the code to handle that. But there may be more attention needed to, to deal with that. Um, you've seen the example before with the hosts um, grouped into clusters and grids. Uh, but when you install the ganglia package on the host, how does it know which cluster to join? Um, the current version of the agent is configured using a static uh, text file. Um, so you can include a text file in the package. Um, you can also use um, a tool like Puppet. If you have a, a Unix platform and you have Puppet across your whole network, you can use that to, to join different hosts to different clusters. Um, but in, um, in an organisation that has Windows and that has you know, some hosts that are quite old, you know, deploying Puppet would you know, significantly magnify the effort of installing Ganglia because then you've got to install two products and not just one. Um, so that's a, another challenge that, that we're looking at in the Ganglia project. Um, to run Ganglia on Windows, you, you currently need uh, Sigwin. The good news is using Sigwin, it, it does work and it's, it's quite effective. Um, the bad news is that there are issues with having multiple Sigwin applications on, a, on the same host. Um, so once again, if you've got a, a lot of Windows hosts and if some of them have been around for a long time and some of them are quite new and they're all running different applications, you may not know if some of them already have Sigwin. And so when you put the Ganglia agent on there, you could break something else. Um, so once again, the Sigwin DLL is a challenge that we need to deal with. Um, with the project that I've been working on and participating with the open source community, we've been able to discuss many of these issues um, and to find ways to, to manage them. Um, some of that work has been contributed back to the open source project. Um, so just to, I'll just bring Bernard back now to, to wrap things up and then we can go into some questions or some further demonstrations. So. Hello. Okay, so well, thanks, Daniel. Um, so yeah, so how can you guys get started uh, if you want to try it out? So I guess the easiest way to just use the prepackaged stuff, so you know, um, the Debian packages like um, Red Hat, Fedora, Suzy, I mean, they're all like, you know, been around for, for some time. And um, even on Solaris, I think recently, um, Daniel did a lot of work. Well, actually, it work, works now, right? The OpenCSW, so, so you can get it for Solaris even. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned before, like even though you have different distributions, you know, you just install um, the packages, they should just work. Um, the only issue is sometimes like with the, the free one version, you can't really mix it with free old, but that's just like some subtle um, issues. So yeah, again, just install Gmundi on all the computers you want to monitor the, the, for metrics and dedicate one server for Gmundi and a web server and basically you're done. So you don't, in theory, you don't really need even a configuration file for Gmond, but you know, you, you can use it if, if you want. So if if you want the bleeding edge stuff, or somehow like you know there are no prepackaged uh, packages, then you can download the source tarball or even from our, our repository and then just build it. So you know, website ganglia.info, you can you know see what uh, we've been doing and. There's a wiki in our SourceForge webpage, and um, there's, so 
we, we provided um, this framework for you to monitor your systems and, and, and also these custom ways of like feeding these metrics. So there actually is a community around it um, to sort of write their own metrics so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So you know, there's people writing, um, you know, as I mentioned before, like you know, monitor Apache or Memcached or you know, there's a whole bunch of um, like these custom metrics that has been um, created already so you can check it out before you, you, you write it. So finally, to you know, there are a couple mailing lists, Ganglia General, these are all hosted on SourceForge. Um, Ganglia Developers is the developer uh, mailing list, and you know, we are on RC, Freenode. There's a, a, a Twitter sort of aggregation um, feed, um, and you know. So actually one, one um, group of people I'm you know, particularly interested in inviting to sort of join the project is, you, I guess you've seen now, our, you know, front end. I mean, it's been it's been like that since you know probably the past past five to ten years. I mean, it's pretty functional. But you know what? I you know as the project goes on, what will be nice is a way to customize you know what you know you see on the front end. So there's there's already work done to make the front end more modularized so that you can customize it because some. Like depending on your your company's organization, some group of people may want to see like your ganglier um, graphs in one way, and then another group may want to see it different ways. So it would be nice to sort of provide some mechanism so that it's very easy to customize without even like writing any code or anything. So so if there are any like Ajax or you know sort of JavaScript gurus who are interested in working on a, a front end project, um, let us know. So. I think with this, um, I'd like to thank uh, Daniel for helping me prepare the slides. I mean, he did you know all the stuff, and thank you, Fostem, for inviting us to to give this talk. So, thank you. So I think we have you know, um, if you want to have any questions. Maybe I should be looking at the mailing list, but we're using Ganglia with IPB, IPv4. Are there any issues moving to IPv6? Uh, sorry, say that again? Uh, we're using Ganglia with IPv4. OK. Are there any issues in moving to IPv6? Um, you said Rx. OK, sorry. Just are, are there any issues uh, on moving to IPv6? Have you seen installations using IPv6? IPv6? Yeah. Um, Actually, that's a very good question. I don't, I'm not aware of any, um, I would assume that uh, as long as your network, you know, the, you know, your operating system supports it, I'm not sure if we need to uh, make any, any modifications to the code because it's just, actually, does anybody, you guys know? Have you guys, yeah, so, yeah, maybe take this, we can take this offline because I haven't, I'm not aware of anybody sort of um, needing this, um, you know, use yet, so. I know, I know V6 does at least somewhat work because it broke, the, broke BSD fairly badly when the port went in, so I know it's in there. So, in, like you're saying that it works with, with Ganglia just by default? Yeah, because I haven't, I haven't tested it. I have, actually haven't seen much traffic about it. So, but uh, I mean, definitely try it out, and if.